But uh, it's going to be going to be a fun day, and excited about it. But we're getting ready to have our adult Bible study, and our legacy group, of course, is taking care of a lot of things today. And uh, Sister Dalton is going to be teaching us this morning. And so why don't we? I know you're just sitting down, but why don't we stand? One more time, let's just lift our hands and invite the presence of the Holy Ghost in as she comes to bring the word of the Lord. Jesus, we come to you. We thank you for your Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let's praise him again. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory. Blessed and holy is your name. Oh, God, we love you today, Lord. And we worship and praise you, Lord. Blessed be the holy name of our God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful opportunity today to be in the house of the Lord. We never want to take it for granted. There's many people in this world, I'm persuaded this morning, that would love the opportunity of being able to go to the house of the Lord. But for various reasons, they're not able to go. But we have the privilege of a beautiful day and health and strength, praise the Lord. And provision that we can get here. Praise the Lord. God is so good to us and we never want to take for granted all of his wonderful blessings. Uh, We want to, while you're standing, I want to say what a privilege it is that I've been granted the opportunity to be used of the Lord one more time. I love my pastor, his wife, and I love this church. You're such an encouragement to me and such a blessing in my life. But today... Uh, We come to this place to worship and to study the Word of God and be able to be more effective in the kingdom of God. That's what we want to be. I want to be better than I was yesterday. You might say, oh, Sister Dalton, you've you've been in this way a long time. That's okay. There's still plenty of room for improvement. Praise the Lord. And there's still a job for me to do. There's a job for each one of us. But today, uh, before you're seated, we want to just go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to ask our pastor to ask the Lord to bless our Bible study. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Uh, I, the Lord had began to deal with me concerning this subject a few days ago, before actually before Brother uh, Burks had asked me uh, to teach this Sunday, and uh, then I get to church Wednesday night, and uh, Brother Stanley, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, just uh, kind of walked all over my uh, Bible study, but that's okay. On the way home, I told my husband he didn't have any idea about it, and I said, well, you know, I think Brother Stanley almost taught my lesson tonight. And he said, well, that tells you something. You're both in the same mind, and God's trying to get a message to us. And uh, so I I didn't hesitate to go ahead with what the Lord laid on my heart. And uh, he preached a wonderful message uh, Wednesday night about being determined. And that's very timely because we've got to have our mind made up as a child of God that we're going to be faithful unto the end. And the, de- the devil and all of his demons are aware that his time is very short. And so he's come after us with everything he's got. But we have got to be able to stand, and the greatest part of that is knowing how to stand, what God requires of us to be able to stand, and then being persistent and determined in our walk with God. Uh, There's been many times in my life that I've been tempted to just uh, more or less throw in the towel, so to speak, and just turn around and say, well, I failed and and I'm just going to give up. But then I thought, it's not my reputation alone that's on the line, but it's the reputation of my God. It's the reputation, reputation of the church that I represent. 
And many times that's been an encouragement to me to get up and to dust myself off, so to speak, and go another mile Amen. for God. And in that time, the Lord would encourage me and give me direction. But this morning, uh, we want to turn our attention. I'm going to have a lot of scriptures this morning, so I won't ask you to stand, but you might want to turn to 1 Corinthians 9, beginning at verse 24. We find the scripture says, Know ye not that we which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, we find that we're instructed here that life is like a race that we're all running, and that's what Brother... Uh, Stanley presented in his message Wednesday night. We're all in a race, and I don't know about you, but it seems like sometimes I'm running faster than I have ever run. This weekend has been so hectic for me. Uh, one thing, a family reunion and different things that's been going on, company coming in, and it just seems like it's been pressure, and not that I didn't enjoy it now, don't get that idea. But it just seems like we're constantly on the move. And if we're not careful in all of this hurry, sometimes we neglect the things that really takes time for us to nurture. We'll get in a hurry, and first thing you know, we're talking to God on the run. We don't have time to sit down and have a conversation with Him and let Him talk to us. We're just talking to him as we hurriedly go through our routine. But we're in a race for our soul. And we realize that if we're going to run, it says here that run that ye may obtain. We're running to win. I'm not running to hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. But I'm running for him to say to me, that, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I feel like every one of you feel the same way. But there's some things that we have to do if we're going to run lawfully and qualify to win. And that's the name of my message today, qualifying to win. There's a lot of people running today, so to speak, in the Christian world, but they may not be running exactly in the direction and in the way that's going to qualify them to win. And we are running today trying to obtain that crown of eternal life. Praise the Lord. But to do that, there's some qualifications. We've instructed in His Word that we have to be temperate, we have to have self-control, we have to obey the rules. We have to study. We have to fast and bring our flesh under subjection. And we have to be faithful. Now, how do we know those things? Through His Word. But we've got to study His Word to be able to really know. There's a lot of people in this world that they're depending on somebody else to tell them how to be saved. They're, not, they're too busy to take the time to search it out for themselves. I know one time when Brother Watson was pastoring us years ago, I was a very young saint, uh, he told us about visiting with a doctor that he used a lot. And he asked that doctor uh, about his relationship with God. And he said, oh, I'm fine. He said, he said uh, I'm fine, Brother Watson. said, well, have you obeyed all the word of God? And he said, I do just exactly what my preacher tells me to do. Well, that's not the plan of God. His preacher may not have the right interpretation of what the rules are to become a winner. 
So we have, even though we have utmost confidence in the ministry, we have utmost confidence in our leadership, yet it pays us as an individual to study the Word of God, and that's why Brother uh, Burks has encouraged all of us to read the Bible through in uh, this each year so that we know for ourselves if we meet the rules and the qualifications of winning this race. Now, we find in Galatians 2 and 1 a great example. We find where Paul is saying here, he said, Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now, he said 14 years later, he was checking up on himself. So we never get to a place that we don't need to continually be checking up on ourselves, making sure that we're still obeying the rules and that we're still running in the right direction. We have not varied from the goal. We've got to keep our eyes on that goal. There may be a lot of distractions along the way, but let's keep our eyes focused and make sure like Paul did. He went up and he communicated with them that were in authority, that he trusted to give him good direction. But he asked them, am I still preaching the gospel that I need to be preaching? Well, in the scripture that we read a while ago, it kind of shoots all these theories of once saved, always saved, out of the ballpark when it said that he could even be, after he had preached to others, a castaway. So that tells me that we can be faithful for a long time, living for God, but we can allow little things to come into our life that will rob us of where God intends for us to be. And there's a job, as I say, for each one of us in each season of our life. Now, yesterday I was privileged to go and visit with a a family, and there were 60 members of that family there at that reunion. Now, that was uh, a lot of time had gone by and the kids had grown up. And honestly, uh, some of the kids, the last time I saw them, they were little bitty tykes. And now they've grown up big teenagers and some of them even more so. But time has a way of robbing us sometimes. Uh, Have you ever thought back or run into somebody and they begin to tell something and you don't even remember what they're talking about? Uh, and I, I look at them and I think, uh, you know, I don't have the slightest idea what you're even talking about. And they knew all about it. Well, time robs us of a lot of things. I like to tell my husband sometimes, uh, I tell him, well, my mind's just so cluttered. It's like a computer. I got so much up there till and some of the stuff that gets erased, I guess. But uh, it's getting more erased all the time. But Paul uh, knew that our God is a precise and organized God. Now, God doesn't do anything just unorganized and, well, you just do the best you can with it. But he gave us explicit instructions. He gave us examples. That's what the Word of God is for, is to teach us not to make the mistake that some of these other folks made. And so we have to study and we have to prepare and work in conditioning ourselves. Psalms 119 and 32 and 33 says, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Now, I, I read that and I thought, enlarge my heart. And I thought, you know, that's exactly what he does for us. If you go to the gym, now some of you may go to the gym and work out. And... Uh, I have exercise, believe it or not, at times. But um, most young people that go to the gym, 
and exercise. They're wanting to build up their muscles and, and uh, you know, look very fit. And when we uh, seek after God and we begin to bring our flesh under subjection and we begin to fast and we study the Word and we draw near to God and allow Him to pour back into us what we need, we become strong in the Lord and our heart becomes enlarged in the things that will please God. And that's a position that we get in when we begin to develop convictions of our own. Now, there's a lot of people in this world, they, they want to live just as close to the world as they can. But when you really begin to condition yourself in the Word and the will of God, you find yourself wanting to get farther away from the world and the things of the world and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. You're wanting to become more like Jesus. And in this race, we want to take time that we can come to the place. And the beautiful part of that is that when He enlarges our heart, we begin to run more in His commandments. We become more like Him. How many times have you ever heard, and I've heard elders pray this, and I've even prayed it myself because I are an elder. But... I've said, Lord, I want to be more like you and less like myself. I don't want to be like I was yesterday. I don't want to be, have the attitude of yesterday. Not that it was real bad, but I want to be more like him. I want to have more of love in my heart and joy in my soul and more compassion and be more long-suffering. You see, these things we get from God because our nature is really not to be long-suffering. Now, you may have a nature like that. You're, very, you're peculiar. <laughs> Most of us, it, you know, we come into this world selfish. First thing we learn is me and mine. We come here looking out for self. And that's good to a point. But there comes a time that we need to begin to look out for others. Then he went on and said, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statues, and I shall keep it unto the end. Unto the end. And some of us in here, in this class, are drawing close to the end. You might say, Oh, Sister Dalton, don't talk like that. That's morbid. I don't want to hear that. Well, common sense and the rule of statistics tells us that the biggest part of our race is already behind us. And so it behooves us to do like Paul, check up on ourselves, and make sure that we're still running and qualifying to win. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Uh, when we begin to look at 1 Timothy 1 and 19, it says, Holding faith and a good conscience which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So there comes a time that we have to walk by faith. Now that's not beside. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Walking by faith. Uh, we find how necessary this is when we look at Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 21 through 23. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, now this is Jesus, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That tells me there's going to be some people that's running, but they're not qualifying to win. They're running. He said, But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven... So there takes, uh, we have to meet a qualification to be able to win. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name have done marvelous works? 
See, so many people in this world today, what they want to see is a marvelous work. They're looking for a sign. And that was true in the day of Jesus. It's been tr through, true all through the scripture. Give me a sign. Well, if we're not careful, we can misinterpret the signs that we see. Maybe they're not from God. As the old saying goes, everything that glitters is not gold. So we have got to be filled with the Holy Ghost, the power of God, be sensitive to the leading of God's Spirit that we can discern whether it's of God or not. I believe that we're going to see more instances of this kind of work at the end than we ever have before. There's going to be demonstrations that if we're not careful, we might believe a lion be damned. We're going to have to be sensitive to the Word of God and to His Spirit and try the spirits and see if they be of God. Don't be gullible, but believe that God will lead and guide and direct you. But just as strong as the devil will work in this last day, Jesus desires to work just as strong in our individual lives. But we have to allow him to. We have to seek after him. We have got to crucify this old flesh. Verse 23, and then I will profess unto them. Now they said, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, I've prophesied in your name. We've cast out devils in your name. We've done marvelous works in your name. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, somewhere along the line, somebody has had some self-deception. You can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. I remember a lady, and, and I'm not making any reflection on her today as an individual, uh, a lady that I really appreciate and, and is a fine woman. But I tried to witness to her one time, and well, many times, but this one time in particular, I was trying to witness to her. And I had tried before, and, and she kind of slammed the door in my face and let me know she wasn't interested. But that day she turned and she looked at me and she said, I do not believe the scripture that way. And I don't want to hear about it anymore. That broke my heart. And I told her, I said, well, I said, I've done all that I can to share with you what God has showed to me. But now it's, in, it's individually between you and God. That's all we can do. That's as far as we can go. Every man has to answer for himself. And if we want to win and hear him say, well done, we're going to have to run according to his rules. We're going to have to seek according to his rules. And there's uh, ways that we go about getting in the race. First of all, for any individual to even get uh, to participate in a winning race, he has to be drawn of God. John 6 and 44 tells us, No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. So, first of all, we've got to be drawn unto God. He said, Whosoever will. Now, that's an open invitation. But you've got to be drawn of God to be able to get yourself into the position to really enter this race and be a winner. I've seen people grip the back of the pew in front of them and say, oh, if I could just feel God draw me one more time. See, so many times we, we take for granted when God's Spirit is moving and God begins to deal with us and we know we need to go down, we need to surrender to God, but because of various excuses that we've allowed to hinder us, we say, well, I, 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 I'm going to, but at another time, we're kind of like Agrippa, at a more convenient time, 
Uh, I want to hear and I want to feel what I feel tonight, but right now is not the time. Because of such and such, I, I can't really live for God right now. But I've seen some of those very same people at a later time in life grip that pew in front of them with tears running down their face and tell me if I could just feel what I felt. If one more time I could know that God was really drawing me. But I don't feel that anymore. The cares of life, deception, overrule their judgment to go and to seek God. As I told you before, a man dying with cancer that I knew that God had dealt with many, many times, his wife had lived for God for years, told me, he said, I've, I've said no to God so many times. I, I, I know I, I need God now more than ever, but, but I just I don't feel like it's right for me to even ask him. And I said, no, that's nothing but the trick of the devil. Cast yourself on the mercy of God. That's where we all are, is on the mercy of God. None of us deserve what he's done for us. But he paid a price that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Praise the Lord. We find that in Ecclesiastes 9 and 11, the scripture says, I returned and saw under the sun... That the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, yet neither bread, nor yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. See, sometimes we get the idea in our head that, that uh, people that are more uh, able to do things have a priority over us, and that's the rule of the world, you know. Uh, lots of instances in this world we find out as we go along that it's not what you know, but it's who you know. Have you ever run into that circumstance? Most of us have. But this race that we're talking about, you don't have to be swift to run it. If you had to be swift, I'd have to get out of the race, Brother Burks. Uh, you know, if you ever see me running, you better run because there's probably a bear after me. And uh, I'm trying to get away, but he'll catch me. Don't worry about it. And he said, our riches to men of understanding. Thank God we don't have to have money to buy this gift. Praise the Lord. I tell you, I have a whole lot more today that God has blessed me with than I could have ever imagined having on my own. Praise the Lord. But never has there been a time in my life that God has not come to my rescue and made a way for me where there seemed to be no way. And there's been circumstances that's come my way that I couldn't understand. And I thought, how in the world did I get into this position? I don't have an answer. I don't have any way out. I don't know how in the world it's going to work. But God allowed me to get there so that he could prove himself to me and show me that I would never be in a position that he couldn't take care of. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He even makes our enemies to be at peace with us. And somebody that means to do something bad to us, well, just let them do it. God will turn it around into something good for us. Praise the Lord. It works every time. But then he went on in the scripture and, and told, uh, told us, but time and chance happeneth to them all. So we all have a chance. I don't believe that there will be an individual that will be able to stand before God on the judgment day and say, I never had an opportunity to really know anything about you. Because he visits us. It may be on our bed at the midnight hour. It may be during a crisis that he comes to us and presents himself. But some way, somehow, he's going to reach for every one of us. And it's up to us to allow him to come into our life. Praise the Lord. And then there's a registration for this race. You don't just see a bunch of people running and get out there in, in a race and expect to win it when you haven't registered for it. You know, there was a man in the Bible one time that he was a runner back there in the Old Testament. Well, uh, runners were very important people because they didn't have cell phones back then. 
And if the king wanted something told to all the kingdom, he had to send runners out to carry the message from place to place. And uh, they called this, uh, this other young man to run and to take the message. But he wanted to run. He wanted to go and, and take the message. But since the king asked the other young man to run, he said, can I run too? In other words. So he just ran along with him. But they were so popular back in that day, bringing messages until the people along the routes could look at them and see them coming way down the road there, and they could identify them by how they run. Hey, everybody gather up. we got a message coming in. There comes whoever. But thank God the Lord gave us a message written that we can read and we've been blessed to live in America where we had education and we've gone and studied and learned how to read for ourselves. praise the Lord. But there's still countries in this world that do not know and have the opportunities that we have to read the Bible or even have a Bible. And that's why we send missionaries to the field to help them to learn this beautiful message. But registration time comes in obedience to Acts 2.38. What are we going to do to be able to qualify? Well, number one, Acts 2.38, you've got to repent of your sins. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. You've got to receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And then you've got to be faithful unto the end, praise the Lord. And the promise is not to just to you, but it's to your children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What a beautiful registration. And every one of us qualify. I heard somebody talking yesterday about applying for a job, and, and um, because of uh, something that had happened on his birth certificate, uh, they would not allow him to have the job. It was in a government position. And uh, because of his birth certificate, he could not qualify. And I, I thought about how little things like that are so very important in the world that we live in. And you'd be surprised. You start doing a little bit of genealogy search, and you find out there's a whole lot of mistakes made on those birth certificates that you don't know anything about until you start trying to search out. And so Acts 2.38, there's nothing that's going to stand in the way of you meeting the qualifications of just surrender to God, praise the Lord. And when you repent of your sins, you know, I've seen people that, uh, and I'm not say I, I, I sought the Lord quite a while myself, so I'm speaking from experience. I think a lot of times when people don't get the Holy Ghost right away and they keep seeking God and seeking God, that they're really mistaken. They're seeking the tongues. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right. They're seeking the tongues and every time the Spirit of God comes on them and they don't know how to yield to it and so they don't speak in tongues. And I've even seen some speak in tongues but just couldn't accept the fact that they got the Holy Ghost. But we're not seeking the tongues. We're seeking the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God that comes into our life, praise the Lord, that will help us to be the overcomer that He designed us to be. And when He comes in, the tongues will take care of themselves. You don't worry about that. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I remember one time, and I've told this before, but I remember one time there was a, Brother and Sister Watson, was uh, they worked in the nursing homes and hospitals a lot in their ministry. And, and uh, they had gone to the nursing home, and, and this little lady told them, said, um, I'd love to come to your church, but she said, I'm of another faith. And she told him, told him what, he, what she was, and she said, so I, I don't believe like you. And he said, that don't matter. I, that don't make any difference at all. We want you to come. It doesn't matter what kind of faith you are. And so she said, well, if you'll come get me, I don't have anybody else to take me to church. I'll be glad to go. And, uh, and so him and Sister Watson would go pick her up. And he said when somebody would go to the altar, she'd go up to the altar and she'd just pray with them. And, and so some of the people come to him and said, she don't even have the Holy Ghost herself. What are you letting her go up there and, and pray with them folks for? 
And he said, you just leave her alone. If she wants to go up to the altar, you let her go up there and pray with those folks. She's not hurting anybody. You just let her go on. And so she just came, but she'd tell them every now and then, I, I don't believe this way, but I like coming to church here and I like the people, you know. Well, God began to move one night and the altar was full and she went up to pray with somebody. And, and so all of a sudden they look at her and she's got her hands up and she's speaking in tongues. She was filled with the Holy Ghost. And when she got a, uh, the Spirit of the Lord finally lifted off of her, she said, I never believed it before, but I got the Holy Ghost myself. Praise the Lord. So you never know. God has a way of drawing, praise the Lord, and filling people that are honest-hearted with His great Spirit. Now, to uh, qualify to win, there are certain conditions, and we want to look at Romans 12 and 1. The scripture says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, a lot of people in this world, they want, they want the Lord, but they don't want to make any changes. I want to live just like I'm living, talk just like I'm talking, walk just like I'm walking dress just like I'm dressed, and everything going to stay the same, but I'm going to be saved. You know, really and truly, it's a hard, uh, you have to go a long way sometime to find somebody that really thinks they're lost anymore. Now, when I got the Holy Ghost, uh, there was many services that uh, while we were singing songs at the beginning of the service, Somebody would jump up and, I need God, and run to the altar crying and seeking God. You don't see that a whole lot anymore. It wasn't anything for, uh, to come out of the prayer room, and as the people of God came out of the prayer room and came into the auditorium, the power of God just came in with them, and all of a sudden everybody was up at the front and crying and praying and seeking God. But we don't see that too much anymore. But when we begin to offer ourselves, present our body, a living sacrifice. God, I want to live for you. You know, that's one thing that uh, the devil worked on me about. said, you know, if you get that Holy Ghost, you can't do this and you can't do that. I wasn't a bad girl. Uh, I never partook of a lot of things. I was never... Uh, uh, Somebody said to me one time when I was talking to them, they said, you were never a free sinner. I said, what do you mean? Well, what they meant was when I sinned, I felt condemnation. And many nights I would lay on my bed and I'd think, oh, Jesus, don't come tonight. I'm not ready, Lord. Please don't come. I need the Holy Ghost. I need to live for you. But circumstances sometimes hinders people from doing what they really know they need to be doing. But that's not a justification. We've got to overcome those circumstances. And God made a way for me to be able to overcome. Even though sometimes it's not the way that we would really like for it to be. But God's ways are right regardless. But what he asks of us is nothing but our reasonable service. How much did he give for us? He gave everything for us. He gave his life for us. He died that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He suffered. We cannot even imagine the torture that he suffered that we can have this beautiful life we have. And then there has to be a change in our attitude. Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let me tell you something. The cloud of witnesses that he's talking about is overcomers that live for God, and they suffered many, many things in their life. There's nothing new under the sun. Somebody has walked through the valleys that you're walking through. Somebody has overcome. He said, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. 
You know, that word patient, <laughs> it's a loaded word. And it's something that some of us have a hard time dealing with. Patience. But we have to be patient. We have to wait upon God. And I think he's taught me some of my most valuable lessons in waiting. Because when I want something, I wanted it yesterday. I just didn't think about it. <laughs> then we have to have determination that Brother Stanley preached to us about so ably Wednesday night. But I love the way Micah said in Micah 7 and 7. He said, Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. There's no question about it. Now, he heard Job all the time, but that didn't mean he performed a miracle of deliverance for Job. Job was going through a test, and there's times we have to go through a test. And we have to be faithful. God is hearing us every time we get down and we begin to pray, we begin to cry. Sometimes we begin to wallow in our self-pity. Somebody was telling me one time about a message their preacher preached, and that preacher is just a short way down the road here. But uh, he was telling me this man was, said, oh, you ought to heard what my preacher preached Sunday night. We'd share messages. And I said, what was it? He said, uh, he said how ridiculous it is when you're having a pity party and God shows up. I think I would like to heard that one myself. I've had a few of them. But then Michael went on and he said, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. My God's got everything under control. I'm telling you, devil, I might fall, I might stumble, and I'm getting more like that all the time, them stumbling things. But I may fall, but I shall arise. Praise the Lord. I may have to have somebody help me get up. So I'm going to tell you something. We need one another. I, I used to look at the elders in the church, and I thought, man, they have got it made. If I get to be their age, and they weren't as old as I am now, but I'd think, oh, if I get to be their age, I'm just going to, I'll have it made. You know what? They'd tell me, no, 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 I haven't got it made. Well, I found out how that works now. And then I want to talk to us a little bit about distractions. Have you ever been distracted? I'm afraid a lot of our car accidents are happening because people are distracted. We got too much on our mind. We're looking at too many things. We're hearing too many things. We're thinking about other things while we're driving down the road. And the first thing you know, we can get distracted. Galatians 5 and 1 said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath, hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, we talked about that Wednesday night. Just throw off those, that bondage that wants to tie you down. Verse 7, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Then he went on and put the icing on the cake because he said, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. If we're allowing things to distract us, it's not God that's bringing these things. It's the trial that we're having from our own flesh and the enemy of our soul. I found out a long time ago, I know the devil, I'm not giving him no praise, but he's always on the job, I'm going to tell you that. But I have a whole lot of problem with my old flesh. Bringing it and keeping it under subjection. But there has to be, to win this race, to qualify to win, there has to be some perseverance. And Galatians 6 and 9 tells us, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Isn't that a beautiful promise? Yeah. 
Just keep holding on. Just keep running. Just keep being determined. Just don't give up. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You make a mistake. You stumble and fall. Get back up. You might say, well, so-and-so is going to condemn me. Don't worry about so-and-so. You're running to please God. If we run to please man, we'll never be a success. Man will always find fault with us. But if our conscience is void of offense between us and God, then we can know that we can hear Him. We're trying to please Him. I I saw uh, a little article that mentioned a message that Sister T.F. Tenney brought. I don't know where it was at, but I read a portion of it. And in this message, uh, she is over the prayer uh, program for the UPC, or was, I think now she's not, but she was, a woman that really seeks God and studies the Word of God. And she said so many, and I'm paraphrasing, so many times in this life we look at hell and death and and, uh, the grave as afterlife. But what we need to really focus on is that this right here is pre-life. We're living, yes. But even if we live to be 80 or 90 or even 100 years old, that's a very short time in comparison to eternity. So life begins when this existence ends. So we're looking at this as pre-life. Our life is going to begin when we lay down this old flesh. That's a beautiful illustration to me. I hope it blessed you in some way. I remember reading a story years ago, and I've shared this before. I want to share it again in closing today. Uh, There was a missionary that had been on the field for many, many years. His health was broken. He, his, some of his family was already gone on to meet the Lord, and he felt like that it was time due to his situation to return home. This was many years ago, and the avenue of travel at that time was by ship. And so he decided, I, I, it's time for me to just give up and, and go home and wait for the Lord to come for me. And so he got his stuff together, and he got on a ship, and he was sailing into New York Harbor. And he thought, when I get there, I know there's going to be a crowd there because I've been on the mission field so long. He had almost lost contact with the people at home except the authorities and the headquarters and people that control the mission field. And he thought, there'll be somebody there to meet me and it'll be a great homecoming. I haven't been home in a long time. It wasn't like it's been in the last few years that they have debutation, which is a beautiful thing to offer them to come home with their families periodically. But he had been there for many, many years. On that ship sailing with him was a very popular uh, celebrity. And so when they got to the harbor at New York, they could hear a band playing. They could hear noise and they knew that there was a crowd awaiting the docking of the ship. He stood on board and he began to search the crowd with his failing eyesight trying to locate somebody that he might recognize. Sailing into his home harbor. But there on the dock he didn't recognize anybody. He couldn't see anybody that looked familiar or looked like maybe they were there for him. So when the ship finally docked and they were given the orders, they could uh, leave the ship. The gangplank was put out and they began to filter down. They found out, he realized, that those people were there with the band and all the cheering and everything going on because of the celebrity that was on board the ship. And in that crowd, in a few moments, he realized... There was nobody there waiting for him to come home. It broke his heart. And he turned aside and he said, Lord, he began to search for God in that moment. And he said, God, 
there's nobody here to welcome me home. That hurt. But he felt the presence of God. And in his heart, he heard the voice of God. And it said, son, the reason there's nobody there is because you're not home yet. That's true for us today. We're in a race and we're running. We're meeting obstacles. We're being tested. Our strength sometimes gets weak. But hey, one of these days, we're going to run streets ago. Praise the Lord. One of these days, we're going to be able to shout on those streets. Praise the Lord. Because one of these days, we're going to be home. Let's qualify to win. Praise the Lord. God bless you this morning. I turn the service back to Brother Burke. Thank you for your kind attention. Amen. Why don't we stand right now? Let's just lift our hands and thank Him. I want to win. I want to make it. Amen. Or oh, for Your Word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lamb of God. Amen. I'm thankful that I registered one day. And it's been 41 years ago. That qualifies me to be in this class today. And, um, but I, I don't regret it. And it gets better all the time. And I want to do everything that I can. Amen. To make it. And, uh. I can still run pretty fast. I just don't need to, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but it's getting slower. But it don't matter. It's not the one that runs the swiftest, but it's he that endureth to the end. I want to make it. Praise God. And here in a little bit, we're going to come back. We're going to let you uh, go take a, take a break. And uh, let's get ready for the next service. There is a little bit of a, a change. Um, my brother Irvin contacted me this morning. He's been sick all night long and uh, up all night, fevered, various things. And he was unable to be here this morning. He was supposed to be preaching for us. And so uh, I called my dad at 7.15 and asked if he could preach. Now, if any of y'all want me to call you next time at 7.15, I will. But I called him because I figured... Uh, after preaching for 50 years or whatever, he might have a message or something. He or might find God in just a little bit there. So, But he, he, he replied that he would. And so Brother Burks is going to be preaching instead of Brother Irvin. We, were, we missed Brother Irvin this morning. We know he would have been enjoyed being here for one thing and then been, been a great, great word for us. But instead, we're going to get with Brother Burks Sr. And he's going to preach the word of God. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Take a break. Let's come back at 11.15.